one too. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I promise you don't have to listen to me again. Um, I'm, I'm excited to introduce Dan Gregory. Uh, Dan Gregory is the director of ITGRC for CBI. He's been with CBI for the last 14 years. Um, prior to joining CBI, Dan was a CIO of an insurance company, Alcos Insurance, uh, which is now Brown and Brown, and uh, in, in a director position with an automotive tier one automotive manufacturer. Before that, um, Dan's going to talk about misbehaving networks this afternoon. Um, he uh, he really this is this is an area that's really interesting to him, and it's interesting to us too. We like to help um, customers understand what a realistically constructed GRC program looks like. And, and, and again, today he's going to talk about misbehaving networks. Dan Gregory. Thanks, Dave. And uh, thanks for that enthusiastic clap. It's, uh, you're a small group, but you guys put out a good, uh, a good sound there. Thank you. I also appreciate the fact that I'm between this group and beers, and you're between me and beers. So we all have that in common. So, all right. Um, Let's go get some beers. All right. Dave, make a run. All right. We'll make this fun, right? We're all here on a Friday afternoon. So I do appreciate you guys sticking it out. I'll make sure that this is uh, definitely worthwhile and uh, we'll get something out of it. Um, it's as interactive as you want it to be. So let's just uh, jump right in. I'm going to do a brief history of analytics because I think it's actually relevant. It'll actually help you understand where we're at today. And we'll also do some, I'm not huge on making predictions. Um, but based on an analysis um, and maybe some back and forth with the group, some Q&A, we can kind of make some group predictions here and some things that we think are going to happen moving forward into the future based on what we're already seeing. Um, we're going to basically tap into the senses um, of the network. I'm actually starting to um, refer to these as senses, and that'll make more sense as we get through what your network is telling you. You have to learn how to see through its eyes, listen through its ears, um, and be able to feel through all of the actual various tendrils of the network itself. Understanding insider threats, behavioral timelines, and then finally we'll establish a foundation for what you might be able to take back and use what you already have in place in your organization to build a behavioral um, analysis or engine of your own with, uh, without um, the need or requirement initially for additional solutions, tools, or, or, um, or, or funding. Um, so while that's up there, um, I'm not going to read, I'm not a big on worded presentations, but there's a nice quote here, and I'm going to actually kind of set the stage while you, uh, while you read through that. So we've all been a uh, part of predictive analytics or behavioral analytics, and I do use those words interchangeably here. You'll understand why in a minute. Understanding um, behaviors of systems, understanding the data that we can gather from a given condition or state or some data that's been given to us, and then using it to make accurate or as accurate as possible predictions as to what's going to happen next based on the data that we've analyzed. That's the big definition here, right? So how do we actually harness the power of that statement and that way of thinking to improve things like IT security, lower risk in the organization, and then measure that effectiveness of a, of a program that we want to put in place like that? The concept isn't new, right? We've all been um, part of behavioral analytics for a very long time, okay? Um, we're all creatures of habit. We all have our own unique things of what we do online. We have hobbies. We have different travel habits. Um, and all these things build a personal behavioral profile about you, okay, in your day-to-day -day life, okay? We're just simply trying to take that same profile and do it between eight and five, okay? And have the organization establish a profile for you, the groups you're in, your peer groups, and other parts of the organization and establish behavioral patterns that makes sense for what you do over a period of time. Okay, and that's the key element here is time. The longer you do this in any system, the smarter the data is, the better the intelligence, um, and the more accurate predictions you can make as to what's going to happen next, to what they're going to do next. More importantly, when something deviates from that behavior, you need to have systems to detect that quickly and respond fast to it. Okay, that's where all this is kind of getting. Okay. Okay. So a brief history. Um, golden age of computers, right? Uh, we're back in the 30s and the 40s. Um, anybody recognize this document? You've probably seen something that looks sort of like it if you're a fan of World War II documentaries. It's a, um, basically, it's a German encoded message. Um, uh, Alex Turning and Good got together and building a decoding system that they had created based on nothing more than the data they were fed. They were able to predict and help solve and actually crack this code essentially based on information they were given. So it's the beginnings of a of predictive analytics um, kind of system that they had built. Same thing with this. 
this is a Kirsten predictor, actually. It's got a very perfect, perfectly named, uh, would mount up underneath the plane and predict where incoming aircraft artillery were coming as a plane would fly through the sky, track the actual trajectory of the artillery shell, and then blast it out of the sky before it actually hit the, the actual flying airplane. It's a predictive analysis engine, but a physical one. Next thing is uh, Manhattan Project, right? We all heard about this one. Um, simulations predicting the behavior of nuclear explosions. They figured it was a lot easier to feed it into a machine than to continue dropping nuclear bombs in the desert, right? So I finally get to do this. I've always wanted to do this. There you go. Hit a button that make that, right? So there you go. Uh, the sound wasn't hooked up. There is actually a very cool nuclear explosion sound that goes along with it. So, poof. Uh, 50s and 60s, right? Um, commercialization ha starts happening um, of the actual analytics that we're gathering. Gentlemen, anybody know who this is? Extra credit if you do. No? John Van Neumann, right? Who knew? Uh, ENIAC basically is used to predict the weather, all right? We're predicting based on the actual system data we're gathering. Anybody who like to travel will understand the, and appreciate this little formula. Um, it is what helps you get from point A to point B the fastest. It's called the shortest path problem. So I see a couple of nods. Actually, there's people out there who, have, if you Google MIT shortest path, if you're really, really having a hard time going uh, to bed one night, Google that. That'll put you right out. But it helps you get from point A to point B. On your cell phone right now, you notice you use Waze, you use Google Maps, you use Siri, whatever it is. This is the formula based on predictive analytics of the, the traffic systems, the time of day, where you're coming and going to help calculate that. We all know this dreaded one, right? Um, been used for a long time. They use certain analytics about you personally to predict and actually create a FICO score for you. You've been, again, you've been part of behavioral analytics for a long time. You just didn't maybe think about it that way. Analytics goes mainstream in the 70s and the 90s. Another little bit of a, a mathematical formula here. Uh, I've got any uh, traders here. This is the formula they use to predict optimal stock pricing for the markets based on predictive analytics, buying patterns in the markets, ups and downs. As you can imagine, lots of variables and lots of data go into that one. Fraud protection. How many people here who have been traveling overseas or somewhere they normally don't go, they go to use their credit card and it doesn't work, right? Your bank's protecting, protecting you. It's fraud protection. It's behavioral analytics. You establish the pattern that says basically um, you don't travel to that part of the world and now all of a sudden you did. So it's protecting you. Another example of predictive or behavioral analytics. Google search engine, predictive analytics, obviously we use that every day. And then finally, Moneyball, one of my favorites because I'm a baseball nut. Um, Oakland A's, if anybody's familiar with it, um, uh, back in uh, 2002 had no right making it to the postseason. They quantified baseball, okay? So if you're really into that kind of thing and you want to nerd out for a little bit, watch the movie, but then go back and read the book. Um, it's called The Art of Winning an Unfair Game. Um, and it's by Michael Lewis. It's a great read. Took predictive analytics in a system, baseball, which is known for generating lots of data and numbers, and he simply just used it to win and get an unfair advantage using predictive analytics. And he almost won that year. He almost won all the way um, and won the pennant, but um, Minnesota, Minnesota took him out um, in the end. But they almost made it to the end. They actually had 20 games in a row that they won that year. So crazy. Um, analytics deep impact. Now we're getting on the present time, right? Um, learning, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, natural language processing is heavily dependent upon your patterns and your behaviors. That's what helps your, your phones predict the next word as you're typing. It knows kind of like, and it gets smarter. It's predicting what you've done before in the past, and it's getting uh, smarter and smarter basically on the data you're feeding into it. Um, Siri, Echo, and that newly announced, anybody heard about the new Harman Kardon? It's called Invoke. Uh, they partnered with Microsoft and Cortana, so there's going to be another one of those things flying around. Um, so um, after that big data analytics arrives, right? There's been um, an explosion of data right now. We're up to 2.5 quintillion bytes each day that we generate as a human race. That is one with 18 zeros after it, right? The number is just you know, mind blowing. Um, we need machines and systems and um, machine learning systems, artificial intelligence or predictive analytics that are intelligent to look through that much data, derive intelligence from it and then create a, an actual predictive engine what's coming next. So what happens is we generate a lot of jobs or demand for jobs. Never before or since, and since uh, I think it was like 2001 was the spike, there was a 15,000% increase in the need for data scientists that could do this kind of thing. As a human race, we're basically saying we need more of this, we want more of this. Uh, marketing companies use it to make money. Financial companies use it to protect their assets and lower risk. I mean, every industry uses this in a different way. 
okay, to predict their consumers' buying habits. It's money. Of course, then sales. Software sales for this type of software um, have grown from 11 billion to 35 billion in the last five years. And it's just, it's not showing any signs of slowing down. So if you guys are investing in stocks, you might want to look at companies that do this kind of stuff. Hint. All right, so what's next? Let's jump ahead now and make some, uh, some predictions based on this. Some of these actually already starting to happen. It's almost hard to keep up. Mark Zuckerberg stood up a couple years ago and made a very bold statement. He said, and I want to make sure I get this quote right, we plan to cure all diseases by the end of the 21st century. That is a huge claim. Some might call him crazy. So that's, you're, there's no way, it's never going to happen. You, won't, you didn't think this through. Someone like Mark Zuckerberg, with his resources and money and connections, okay, stood up in a public forum and said that. The fact that he even was able to say it means he has to be backed up with a lot of behavioral analytics and predictive analysis, right? Healthcare organizations and all their professionals need to have the data and then run all the, the analytics against that to actually run ahead and say, we've cured all diseases. There's no other way to actually do that. So it's kind of like the crystal ball effect that kicks in with this type of technology. You can't get there without it. Next thing is predictive policing. So we're like, it's not minority report stuff. They're not going to show up a week, you know, you know, in a week and say, we're going to arrest you for a crime you're about to commit a year from now. But right now already, um, police forces have access to data that actually are running predictive analysis, behavioral analytics based on the geos in their area, so it can actually police certain areas in different ways and be there before something actually happens or goes down. It's happening right now. I have a couple friends who are um, associated with um, the police force down in Ohio, and they say they're already starting to do this and use data at their disposal to do this. Keeps everybody safer, including them. Final one, targeted marketing. Sorry, marketing people in the room, mass marketing is dead. We all know that. How many times have you gone to a website, let's say you wanted a, I'm a hiker, so I'll go and look at backpacks or you know, equipment for hiking, and then I'm like, all right, I found the one I want. I go to Amazon, because I'm a Prime guy, and I love my Amazon Prime. I go to Amazon, and instantly, the entire first splash screen that I land on has banners just overflowing with exactly what I, was been, I had been searching for, for for hours before that. Okay, that's targeted marketing, and it's, uh, it's happening more and more and more. We have the data, the skills, the speeds uh, for, uh, on, on our processors, uh, on our systems to actually keep up with, in real time, behavioral analytics and use things um, and generate things like targeted marketing. So. Um, pretty bold statement here by Semantic Internet Threat uh, Report that just came out in April. It's a great read. If you haven't found it, you know, go out there and uh, download that. Um, they're talking about insider threats, right? And the fact that the old regime, the old way of doing it, okay, isn't going to keep up, right? We need inside, we need behavioral analytics, right, um, to kind of get to the next step. We can't be reactive anymore as an industry, which is essentially still where we're at. That predictive or proactive approach has to kick in. Behavioral analytics will get us there. All right, so senses, all right. Um, generally, human beings have about five recognized or normally recognized um, senses, um, unless you're one of the, the lucky ones. Uh, sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch, right? Your network has similar senses. You just need to be able to plug into them, use them, see through the eyes, hear through their ears, etc. cetera. And um, here are just a few, okay? There's a lot more than that, but you already have some or all, or many, many more of these in your networks right now. They're generating tons of data. That's one thing they all have in common, right? Um, what we want to do is harness all of that information, okay, and convert that into a behavioral analytics kind of CMDB of sorts. We can actually overlay that with a, a behavioral analytics engine and listen to it and then convert that into that proactive approach for managing risk and um, increasing security. And that's really what this is all about, right? So right now, the approach is to listen, essentially, to one, maybe a few of these grouped together in concert with one another. It'd be like going to an orchestra here to hear a nice um, piece of music, but you put every instrument in a separate soundproof room from one another, and then you go into that door, you listen to the violin, you leave, you go out, and you listen to the triangle, then the drum, then the you know, then the horns, and you try to assemble all that in your head and make sense of it and figure out what song they were playing if they're all in the room at the same time. Behavioral analytics will get them all together in concert playing so you can see that mosaic, that, that obvious trend that's going on, and the processing power behind behavioral analytics will allow you to recognize patterns quicker 
okay, and draw your attention to it in more real time. We're going to go through an example here in a moment of what I'm talking about. But that, uh, that analogy generally pr uh, rings true. So we need to harness that power and aggregate that data um, and analytics from these individually powerful solutions. We already have a lot of these, right? We just need to kind of put them to work better for us. So here's a question for the group. Anybody want to speak up? That's fine. Let me know. What do you consider to be your organization's top vulnerability? Now, this is data that was collected over the last 10 years and aggregated um, from Ponemon and uh, Wisegate, Gartner, and Forrester, and a couple others. They all generally ask the same questions in their annual surveys. And this question is asked every single year. Anybody want to throw one out? Like if it was your organization, what's your top vulnerability right now? Employee awareness. Employee awareness, that's a good one. Anybody else? No? Insider. Insider? Yep, it's a good one. And if I had some swag, I would throw it at you. So <laughs> there you go. It's, uh, it's not clearly number one, but it's been number one for over 10 years, okay? Uh, closely um, with phishing and malware and everything else. Um, the thing that all these have in common is the human element, right? We have to be looking at it through security, through the actual... Um, the aspect of the person and not the systems. I could care less about the events that my firewall is generating. I care more about how it's being used or misused or abused by people from the outside in and from the inside out. That's really what I, we all want to get to. And we've all known it. We just haven't had a way to get there until recently, right? So that's the top vulnerability. Next question is, what do you see as your organization's top data-oriented security threat? I'm going to throw, throw one out there. Sorry? No? No one? All right. I'll give you guys a clue. It's, so it's data exfiltration, right? Intellectual property or the loss of intellectual property. So when you put this one here, insiders stealing my stuff, basically what this means. We're all afraid of that. Um, so the insider threat basically is always attributed to, it's about one in three breaches uh, can be attributed to the insider itself, okay? That's a known number. Um, in our guts, we kind of know it's true, and there's a reason for that. I just want to put some of the obvious ones up here. The reason for that generally is we already trust them. They're inside, and they have a level of trust. We're not watching them. We're not looking at their behaviors. We're not establishing a profile um, of what they do, baselining it, and then comparing it year after year, day after day, hour after hour, right? So they have that trust. They already have access. We've given it to them. Okay, in most organizations, it's hard to control. Identity access management, access controls, we all know what a pain that is, right? Giving just that need to know level of access is very difficult. So they tend to, the longer they stick around, they get more and more and more access, right? I've been at CBI for 14 years. I can tell you I probably have a little more access to some stuff than I should. Um, it just happens, it's drift, okay? Just a tiny bit more, tiny bit more. <laughs> They know where the data is, okay? So we're building this, this kind of profile on this person here. Um, they have knowledge of defense, okay? They know where the, the gates are. They, some, some of them know more than others, but they generally know what they have that they have to get around if they want to get from point A to point B and what they can get away with. And of course, they have the element of time. I heard someone on the panel earlier say, I think it was Martin Bally, um, say that uh, you know the bad guys, they only have to hit a home run once in a while, and good guys have to do it every single time. It's, I think it's an overused analogy, but generally the essence of it rings true. We, the good guys have to be smarter, faster, better all the time, but you can't establish a, a, a pattern of behavior or a profile on someone or a group of individuals you're never going to meet that randomly attack you, that are constantly changing their position, coming at you from all directions, it's going to be almost impossible. I hate to say that word, but it's, it's very, very, it's much harder than flip it around and go after the bigger problem of the insider and profile that person's behavior, not in a bad way, just get to understand the baseline behavior so you can then use it to recognize when something bad is being, is happening or they're using, um, or if they've lost their credentials, okay? For example, in a phishing attack. A couple of weeks go by, you think everything's fine, the smoke settles, you move on with your life. A couple of weeks later after that, um, the credentials pop up somewhere doing something they shouldn't be doing. The bad guys just waited. That's all. So that's why they're number one. So we're going to go through this little day in the life of Johnny Be Good. Okay? So Johnny works in Detroit, Michigan. Eight to five desk, desk job. He's an engineer. He's pretty young still, 21 years old. He's only got six months with the new company, right? Okay. So we're going to draw out a timeline for him. 
And for this one, my thing is too small and my eyes are too bad for this, so I'm going to have to go up here and look at this. So I'll keep a little louder. So let's just say that, again, John has been here for only six months, and there was some goose chips in there. There was a fishing attack, let's say, around this first week or two when he started on the job. Okay? Again, a couple weeks went by, everybody thought the problem had been taken care of, and life went on. And now this pops up. Hello? There we go. There we go. Oh, I think I have to hold it permanently. I can help. I can do this. Sorry. Hang on, guys. I can zoom a little bit. I'm not going to move here. It's all right. I'll make it work. There we go. I just zoom in on this. Here we go. Is that better? All right. So he logs in, or at least the system picks up the fact that someone using his credentials logged in from a VPN connection somewhere from China, okay? Followed shortly thereafter by elevation of privileges um, on the actual PCI network, okay? All right, that's a little fishy too, but we're talking about two completely different systems that would have to alert me to those events, a VPN concentrator of some kind and a local event management mon monitoring system if I had such a thing, right? Two completely thing, different things. Lucky for you if they actually all dumped to a SIM, but that's 24 seven monitoring. You've got lots of other data flying by in your event monitoring system and it's going to be a blip for one second, and no one's really correlating these just yet. Let's just say for argument's sake. So, um, so Johnny Be Good turns into a Johnny Beware type of thing, right? It's kind of should be elevated. Okay. The next one is a remote session connecting to a critical PCI server from that location. Okay. Then he elevates his privileges from there up to a local administrator on that server. Again, we're talking four different systems here that would be required to just monitor and capture these four basically separate events. Okay? And again, he could be waiting for weeks between these events, or, or actually hours real, more realistically. An SSH connection using root to another server on a biz dev portion of my network. Now I'm on a biz dev server. Okay? So now we're back to Johnny Betrayer. He's kind of getting worse, getting more and more flags. Uh, then he accesses and um, um, all negotiation documents on the biz dev server. Basically, he's scanning and um, searching for specific documentation until finally um, he uses a set of Twitter handles and does a chop and copy um, to get the data out to the internet or someplace out where he is on the outside. So it's exfiltration. Um, so Johnny, be good now is be gone. So this is not an uncommon scenario where after a phishing attack or some kind of um, breach where credentials are stolen um, to actually kind of play out. It's not unrealistic. What is unrealistic is for any organization to be able to correlate that in a way that makes sense based on a behavior profile that we've created for Johnny B. Good before any of this happened. Okay, that's what we want to see is if there's a deviation. So somewhere along on the food chain or the timeline rather around here, Ideally, we want to start alerting people, saying there's actually a rise in a risk level for this particular account, and it's happening as we speak, and it's being monitored, okay? But it's hard to do without some sort of behavioral analytics engine driving that and actually pulling that data out and, ex and, and extracting it. So this is really what we're talking about, is building a system like this. So maybe think about how your organization would do that now with its current processes, people, resources, time, uh, technologies and how difficult it might be and how a behavioral analytics or end user behavior analytics engine might actually help. Um, another one, um, if you guys are all fans of or some of you are fans of the NIST framework, um, it's about to change to accommodate um, something they're actually starting to refer to more and more now um, in print anyways, threat hunting. Okay. It's their way of saying what we've been talking about already. All right, behavioral analytics, right? Defining uh, pro proactively and iteratively searching for threats that have evaded detections by automated detection systems. They're no longer good enough anymore is what they're saying. And they're actually starting to propose changes to the NIST framework. So a good behavioral analytics program should have the following ingredients. It's my last slide. So we can have a little Q&A afterwards if you like. So, building group and unique user profiles, we were talking about that in the beginning. 
So how do you do that? You take Johnny B. Good, okay? You analyze information that you already have. Johnny B. Good has already generated tons of events in his first year on the job or six months. You implement a behavioral analytics program that extracts all those events, build a profile on Johnny, okay? And then moving forward, you continue to monitor his behavior, but not only his, but the groups that he's members of around him in his department with the same job codes, et cetera. Okay, the same geos, um, same access to certain things. So you can actually build those and then predict what might happen next or actually run ahead of that curve. Context-based monitoring, so we just did it here. So you have to be able to do all this in context. We have the who, what, where, why, and when. So it's like a game of Clue, like you know, Colonel Mustard did it in the kitchen with a candlestick. We have all that stuff, but we don't generally be able, we, we generally struggle to pull it all together in context, right? That's what we need to do. And think about all the systems that you need to kind of tap into to, to draw that picture out. Advanced um, behavior anomaly detection. So this is that peer group behavior comparison we were talking about. Not, not Johnny, just not, I'm not just talking about Johnny anymore. I'm talking about the group he's a member of compared to another group. Okay, so there's different levels, administrators, uh, there's entry level, um, guests, profiles, things of that nature. So uh, these are a totally different um, and a, an advanced way of looking at group anomalies versus individual anomalies. Okay, there's systems out there that are designed to do that. And that link analysis driven investigation. So think of it as your DVR. You should be able to play that, that timeline I just said back and forth and be able to pinpoint that um, with these types of systems. And of course, we want to integrate that with um, physical access, um, access event um, uh, systems, uh, telecommunication events, anything you can get data and extract out from, the better profile you'll be able to build, and you'll be able to build an even better mousetrap, so to speak. Finally, the quantification uh, of that data in real-time alerting. Um, all these systems that we buy and purchase and implement are nothing if we can't extract the data and present that in a format that makes sense to the audience that they're being presented to. Executives need a, a view of this. IT professionals, security, operations guys, they all need a different view of this in order to do their jobs and be informed better. So think about that and how that information is going to be displayed out the back end. All right. So promise it would be shorter. I know it's Friday at 4 o'clock, so I try to get through it quickly, but not too fast. Um, is there any questions? Anybody want to talk about something they're thinking about? Have any ideas here kind of sparked something if you guys want to discuss it either in the group or afterwards? Either way? No? Yes? Meaning uh, like a, an organization who doesn't have any of the, the other tools that we'd listed? It is if you have the right talent, right? I mean, you, you can do it if you have a person who can, using what you have, if you have a network, you, you've already got a, a pretty good piece of what you need, right? Authentication. You're gonna, it's going to generate an event when someone logs on to the network itself. You've got one tiny piece of it. When they logged on, you can actually extract that information through either scripting, um, some creative reporting, um, be it Active Directory or whatever you're using, to get information at least on a base profile of when people are logging in. Um, what they're accessing also generates events, uh, what your admins are doing. So at a certain level, you can tap into that one event monitoring stream you have. And with a little bit of you know, elbow grease and some creativity, you could create a poor man's version of a behavior analytics on a certain level. And then what you would have to do, though, and this is the tough part, I'm not sure how it would, you would do it the next part, is you constantly would have to monitor that or at least compare it. It would almost be like an hour-to-hour, day-to-day, week-to-week thing. So that would be the hard thing to do, right? You might be able to take a weekly snapshot um, at best, but then you're just back to event monitoring. So it is tough, and I will admit it's not for everybody because um, that nut hasn't been cracked yet. I don't think we have a very small, medium-sized business behavioral analytics solution yet that scales way, way down, but you can get creative with, uh, with what you have, I think. I, I'm open for any suggestions or open dialogue. Maybe, Wolf, you got something to, to add to that? Yeah, I got, I got something. So, you, you know where I came out of it. We even have a lot of budget or people are in it. Uh, one of the ways that you can just let people know about that is you can just have the
No, it's a good suggestion. So yeah, like a, like a, like a honeypot situation, right? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh. Yeah. It's easier said than done right now, right? Yeah, that's no easy fix yet. So, right, one more here. GDPR? <laughs> right, is, and there's a catch to that, though. I'm gonna, I want to add a little caveat to that. As long as you can show that you're not using it um, to influence performance, um, annual performance reviews for those individuals that it won't be used against them, that changes the game, too. If the organization can show or say that they will not use that data or analytics that they gather in any way, shape, or form to influence your, your review, your performance review, or anything else like that. So that's a, little, it's a bit of a gray area with it. I, I get where you're coming from, though. It, it is challenging. Um, there's 28 states over there right now that have engaged in you know, changing the world with GDPR, and we're all kind of figuring it out as we go along. Um, the bottom line is if, if more than 5,000 private citizens' data is, is either impacted or stored or transmitted by your organization, you fall into it. You have to have the right to be forgotten. You have to have a, an infrastructure that is built from the ground up, purposely built with infrastructure security in mind. Um, there's a couple other challenges, but you're right. That's the big one. And I'm dealing with an organization right now that is headquartered in, uh, in that part of the world, in Germany. And we have has taken our meetings from an, uh, 45 minutes to an hour-long discussion on a simple policy statement to, like, weeks just to get through one bullet point. Like, how is this going to be monitored, managed, policy procedures? It's tough. You know, we're kind of going through a growing, you know, a growing pain right now. But it's a good point. You know, I don't have a clean answer for that one. Yes. They cannot implement DLP. Yeah. They could, technically, they're smart, but they can't because of GDPR. Yeah, because they can't prove that, that thing that they're you know, not supposed to do with it. They can't prove that they're not going to do it. Oh yeah, they would have to change a lot of, uh, that's a great question, they would have to change the, the basic construct of what we perceive now as a user ID and password association, so death of the password, the usernames, anonymization, and everything else, so imagine what that would do to Microsoft, okay, um, not so much, yeah, um, maybe just a different approach, right now, you could do it now, there are organizations, and they do it the right way, no one has, like, D. Gregory, wouldn't be my login name, in their organization. It's like U43902, okay? Doesn't associate me with anybody. It's just a number, right? Um, tokenization, two-factor authentication, and everything else kicks in. I'm a ghost, basically, okay? They don't know that it was me. It's just an ID that logged on. Um, but, yeah, to your point, um, Wolf, um, and, I, and I know where you're coming from there. It isn't like yeah, all the problems are solved, but... It would, it would certainly be a huge step, I think, in the right direction if we start anonymizing user IDs, um, go, you know, two-factor authentication across, across the board. But, you know, that takes care of a lot of problems. Um, but we're not there yet. But I, I would say the software manufacturers have um, a hard time adjusting to it because that's not the way they're built right now, unfortunately. Anybody else? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Recent news. <laughs>
Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a good point. Um, and um, it actually gets back to, I normally don't like to do that one, but I'm going to, you just brought up this right here. It's the threat hunting. So we're not waiting for the problems to come to us. We are now hunting the threats, to your point. It's, it's, it's a great conversation, right? Um, so we're actually actively seeking out the threats now with this behavior analytics. We're not sitting back anymore waiting for something to happen and then reacting to it, knowing that, well, some of the horses got out of the barn. Let's just close the door as quick as we can to keep any more from getting out. We're actually going to go around um, and make sure that we're finding the threats or potential for a threat or a behavior um, might occur. Now, I mean, we could get really outside the box with this and say, okay, we're profiling the, the person themselves, their history, what they're like, what they come from, what job did they have before, why they get fired. I mean, all that, that data is there, right? I'm not saying we're going to go that way, but right now what we have realistically is what they've done on the network and the fingerprints and breadcrumbs they've left. And we can get a pretty detailed profile, a picture of what a person would do in a, in a given search situation. Um, or what they have actually have access to and what they could have done. So it's good for both pro and reactive, but you're right. We've got to become more threat hunters, which is why this language is now starting to come up, which will end up modifying the construct of you know, something as important as the NIST framework. We're hunting the threats now. Um, but yeah, that's a great point. Anybody else? No? Mm. Do you mean an organization implementing it well, or a solution provider bringing as something to market that works? <laughs> yes, no, yes, no. No, <laughs> Well, um, actually, to pick on someone that was actually in the room recently, um, in a former um, life, um, Martin Bally. He's been around for a long time. I respect him and uh, what he's been able to build. One thing he likes is a challenge. He gets bored, he'll move on. Um, and the organization he came from formerly, and actually even what he's bringing back into Diebold now, he hasn't implemented it yet, but his plan on paper, if you can execute on it, will be probably one of the best I've ever, I've ever seen, um, to kind of name a name in a company. Um, he's addressed a lot of these um, scenarios and questions that we've talked about. In fact, I'll admit to actually picking his brain a bit and creating some of the content for this, um, standing on the shoulders of giants and learning from their mistakes and this, you know, things like that. Um, but I would say um, Diebold's got a great plan. I don't know that I've seen anybody do it great yet that I can actually point to. I know we've got a lot of uh, experience between the two of us. How about you? Have you seen anybody you would say that they're doing it really, really even well? Elastica? No. Or the uh, blue coat? No. Mm. So the model is that they would uh, normalize and track user logons and access the system sort of take a database. And you and I are on the same teams, we should be accessing the same thing. Other people are on different teams, they should be accessing the same thing. And build the model around that is very hands off. But then if I start accessing data that my team only does it will work. Mm. I want to say Imperva because it kind of does that, but it's it's not Semantics product. It's it's not coming to mind right now. Securonix. There's Exabeams. There's Bay Dynamics. There's a Bay, Bay Dynamics. There you go. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, yep. <laughs> right. Right. 
Right, and, and uh, to be specific about Bay Dynamics, it's one of those overlays, right? You already have to have the infrastructure and those components that generate the right type of data that a Bay Dynamics would then ingest and give you that behavioral analytics view that Wolf is talking about. So, um, but to answer the original question, I don't think there's anybody doing it really well. Oh, great, we're growing into it still. This is still kind of new. The concept is new. Um, well, I'm sorry, the concept is very old, but the application of it from an IT risk management and security um, you know, perspective is newer. We're growing into it, okay? The threat hunting, the running ahead of it, predictive anal analytics, truly being proactive. We all like to use the word proactive. Oh, I don't want to be reactive, I want to be proactive. Well, how do you do that? Well, then they answer whatever, you know, they give you whatever answer they feel is right at the time, going back a few years ago, and you still can't get ahead of the event horizon where I'm at right now. Event management, sim systems are always a billionth of a second in the past, no matter how good they get. All these other things can only record event after it's happened. For the first time, we're actually talking about taking all that data and saying, okay, what if, okay, what could happen, okay, and stopping it in midstream when bad things, you know, are starting to go down. So we're really starting to get there for the first time. It just took a while for the actual technology to catch up and uh, enough demand to be there for vendors like Securonix, Exabeam, Bay, Dynamics, and others to, to fill that need. <laughs> we hope so, right? We would hope so. Right. <laughs> well, I see that point as well. Yeah. Um, there's a dark and uh, a light side to that whole thing. But um, great point. And what it boils down to basically is we can get all the data. We all know that. We can drown ourselves in information, right? We've, we haven't really figured out what to do with it next or how to ingest it in an efficient way. As humans, we can only react in, in, in real time, right? I mean, systems are much faster than us. We can't keep up anymore, right? So um, to your, your example, it isn't, at the end of the day, that process. It still boils down to FBI agents in the field and a lot of people looking and sifting over data and making, you know, drawing conclusions and saying, okay, this is what happens and this is most, most likely to happen. There's a lot of moving parts in those systems. Okay, um, one organization alone, pick a 5,000 employee organization, uh, traditional network infrastructure, um, is going to generate a ton of data every single day. Does that company, let's say it's in healthcare, okay, they're a hospital, they are there to administer care to patients and make them better than they were when they walked in the front door, period. Everything else is a far, far second, third priority. Do you think they really should or want to, deep down, have the world-class IT organization. No, they know they need it, they do it because it comes along with doing business, but until they relieve themselves of that utility side of IT to organizations designed to do that and give that and relinquish that up and say, hey, I've got a ton of data coming in events, do this behavioral analytics um, thing for me and tell me what I need to know when I need to know it because I'm gonna go over here and do things that are more pertinent to care of my patients and such. It's starting to happen more and more. I've been doing this now uh, at CBF for 14 and in the industry for over two decades, and it's definitely starting to happen. Organizations are more willing to outsource and give that utility side of IT and say, hey, well, I'm not an expert in this. You are. You take that. I'll go over here and do what I'm good at. Okay? That's starting to happen, so that shift will make this easier because organizations aren't going to be successful at behavior analytics if they want to do it in-house especially if they're big. It gets harder exponentially as you get bigger. The data pipe gets bigger. You're drinking from not one fire hose, but 20 fire hoses at the same time. The bigger you get, you can't run ahead of that internally. So to your point there a little bit, there's going to be more outsources. There's going to be a larger, bigger data kind of organizations online that are designed to do and ingest that much information as a service for you and then tell you what the behaviors of the organizations, individuals, and groups look like and as they change real-time response that kind of thing so as a service basically is what i'm feeling i don't know that any organization wants or could actually take that on i'm sorry right now <laughs> it started it right here what's the name of our company quick <laughs>
It is. That's that's easy to find out. In fact, that's part of the, the actual research I did um, to get that history that we went through. There's tons of examples for medical actual analysis that I found. I decided to leave them out. But to your example, um, you're you're 23. Um, you got well. I was going to say, <laughs> 23 years old. Uh, you live in the Midwest. Um, you're a white female. You use your eating habits. Da 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 da. All this other stuff. Yes, it's going to create a cholesterol profile for you that's unique and individual to you. Because your cholesterol might be a different number than someone who looks and acts just like you that lives in Europe, right? Um, so it's it's complete. It's it's happening now already. It's that Zuckerberg thing. It's as close as I got to going down the rabbit hole with all the healthcare. But that's the data they're going to be tapping into and profiling patients um, and, every, and everything else. So. Anything else? Good conversation. No? Makes you think. No? All right. Well, I appreciate your time, guys, especially on a Friday. Uh, we're about 10 minutes short, so I'll give that back to you guys. And uh, enjoy your weekend. And um, if you guys want to talk to me afterwards, I'm going to stick around for a little bit. Thanks so much. Nope.